<clears throat> SJC 11128, <coughs> Commonwealth v. Clyde Howard. Morning. Good morning, Chief Justice Ireland. May it please the court, my name is Robert Shaw. I'm privileged to appear today on behalf of Clyde Howard, if I may reserve two minutes of my time. My intention this morning is to begin by addressing issues that arise out of the interrogation of Mr. Howard. First, whether he invoked his rights at page 42 of the transcript. Second, and separately, um, the interaction and communication that occurred at the outset of the interrogation. And finally, I'll address prosecutorial misconduct, which is intertwined with additional issues that have been raised in the briefs. Now, our first claim arising out of the interrogation concerns the fact that Mr. Howard invoked his right <coughs> to silence at page 42 of the transcript. That happened when the police began focusing on the shooting, uh, the morning of the shooting, and specifically the events that immediately preceded the shooting. In response to that, Mr. Howard said, quote, I would like to stop at that point because it becomes more intricate now. And I would like to stop is clear and unambiguous language for anybody interested in listening. But what the police did is they continued to pressure him. And when they did that, they violated their obligations and his rights at that point. Let me ask you that. Assuming that to be the case, after a, a, a brief exchange, there is a 51-minute 50 break. Is that 51-minute break? So even if one assumes the correctness of your view, um, does the break suggest that when it that it, it when it restarts it can restart or do you say once that he said that breaks or no breaks doesn't make any difference that's exactly correct your honor and you will find that the break has never been raised as an issue from the government um and um but the i judge think that, did i'm sorry didn't the judge make a point of that break um i don't recall specifically whether in her decision but certainly on appeal that's never been raised um, it's never been relied upon. And I think that the proper analysis is to look at Mr. Howard's words. Once we look at Mr. Howard's words, if they are sufficient, we then look to the um, police. They can either stop or they can stop and clarify. And if they fail to do that, they've violated their obligations. We don't then look subsequent to that, to anything Mr. Howard would have said and utilize his words or the events that take place to reinterpret his invocation no, no, no. At I'm that not point. saying. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that. Uh, clearly, it would be the case, right? If, if somebody is being interrogated and says, "I don't want to talk to you. I want a lawyer." Okay. End of subject. The next day. Right. It, I, it don't, could, I don't believe that 51 minutes is sufficient. I don't believe, given his invocation, that they could simply do that and assume that and and come back and their assumption was to sort of roll with this idea that, oh, you told us you would talk to us, and so we want to try to continue here. I'd point out also that there were multiple further violations. I don't have the time this morning to address all of those, but my suggestion to the court is that they're subsumed within and are the fruits of that initial violation. But didn't he initially say, he, when he waived his Miranda rights, that he would talk with them, except as to certain subjects? So when he says he wanted to stop, you know, it doesn't mean I want to stop all questioning. Right, Your Honor, and I want to get into that hopefully um, a, somewhat separately, but I think it, it raises a very important point, with it, which is context. Um, there's very little doubt that the police knew he was invoking his rights because you're right. At the beginning, when they addressed his Miranda rights twice, his response, each instance, when they're talking about these are the ground rules, will you speak to us, happened twice, he says, I'll speak to you, and he makes a point, but I don't want to talk about things that could jeopardize me, okay? So, so they, their response to that is to say, okay, fine. They say, absolutely. Um, we'll respect your guidance about when you want to rely on your rights, essentially, right? So they knew. They were on notice that Mr. Howard was going to tell them when it was that, they, that, that he was going to stop, and that's exactly what he did, but they didn't listen to him, and they kept pressuring him. 
Now, I think it's also useful to look at the Commonwealth's reasoning as to why I want to stop was not an invocation. Um, the Commonwealth says that Mr. Howard um, didn't intend to remain silent because he kept talking. I addressed that already. We don't skip ahead um, to reinterpret his invocation be after the police have pressured him because then we end up rewarding the police for coercive conduct. The Commonwealth also says that he didn't really want to terminate the interview. He wanted to be selective. And now, you know, focusing specifically just on the invocation issue, the fact is that I want to stop is not the language of selectivity. And I think that's a very easy response. Um, now, now to, was there that anything argument. that he said before the 51 minute break that was really um, that bad in no. your case? No. There was not. And I because, think. Because, I mean, it's just the throwing of the gun was really the, um, in the, the, the business of I, I threw the gun in the Charles because I didn't, and, you know, but there was no question. That's correct. Really well, that's correct. At, at, that during their interrogation. One who shot the victim. I mean, that's pretty clear. Right, right. This, this trial was not about whether he shot the victim. Right. This trial was not about the general uh, fact of guilt. This trial was about state of mind and, and the level of culpability. And that was really what was, he, the, the inculpatory statements he made in that regard happened after the break. They did, beginning at about page 48 of the interrogation transcript. Now, so when we look at the invocation issue, I suggest to the court that it's very clear that there was an invocation. Now, moving on to what happened at the beginning of the interrogation um, and an in independent analysis of what occurred when the Miranda rights were read. I suggest to the court that there are basically three different ways the court can interpret this. The first way is the court can look at it, look at the interaction and the communication, and essentially reasonably say, it's not what I suggest the court should say, but you could reasonably say that Mr. Howard essentially said, um, I will speak to you, but um, I do want to rely on my rights with regard to things that could jeopardize me. In essence, I'll let you know when I'm going to do that. The police say, absolutely, we'll um, respect your guidance on that. That brings you then to the invocation issue later on, and it avoids giving rise to any legal issues arising out of the outset of the interrogation. The more complicated issues arise if you take either of two other interpretations. The first is that there was really some conflicting information and ambiguity initially, because Mr. Howard is saying, um, I will speak to you, um, but I also want to rely on my rights. He's making reference to, very broadly, to anything that could jeopardize me. So at that point, the police really should have stopped and said, stopped and clarified. Do you mean that you do not want to talk to us about what happened? That's the reason we're here. I mean, after all, we're not here to talk about how blue the sky is. Um, we're here to talk about the fact that somebody's been killed. Do you want to talk about that or not? They didn't do that. So I suggest that that was a violation at that point. The third interpretation is essentially the Commonwealth's interpretation, which is to say, well, Mr. Howard gave an unequivocal waiver. Well, I suggest it wasn't un unequivocal. What the Commonwealth points to is he used the words, I will speak. Well, he said, I will speak, but I don't want to talk about anything that could jeopardize me. So I don't think that that's um, sufficient. Um, well, what should, the, what should the police do in that cir circumstance? I mean, he said, I'll speak to you. Are the police supposed to stop him when he says, well, now you're getting close to areas that may jeopardize you, and I'm going to respect your invocation of that. Well, I, I think at that point, the police actually should have stopped and clarified. But, but this, this notion, which I think is really an important issue about selectivity, the Commonwealth says, well, Mr. Howard just really wanted to be selective. So once he started to speak, um, the police had no obligation to do anything or say anything because according to the Commonwealth, under the law, he can't be selective. So, you know, the police could just keep talking to him. And then when he said, well, I want to stop, they could just interpret his words as if it was a desire to be selective again. But there is a really, there is really a problem in the jurisprudence here, if that's the way uh, the government is going to rely. And that is that there is nothing in the warnings that are provided to a defendant to indicate that he can't be selective. Now, I don't agree that Mr. Howard was saying, I'm going to be, you know, intricately selective. I, I want to... I'm going to say, I will speak about the criminal event at issue. He never said that. He said, I don't want to speak about it. But 
even he didn't, you know, if he said, I will speak about the criminal event at issue and I'm gonna now, you know, very finely parse the questions. I wanna answer that one, I don't wanna answer that one. That's not what he's doing. But there's nothing when you look at this in the warnings to say that a defendant can't be selective. You have the right to remain silent. But right? who, who determines whether a particular question is something that would that a defendant would agree was something that would put him in jeopardy? Well, I, I, I you know, I think there are various. Want to just have the police say now we're going to ask? Oh you, no! Here comes a question. Yeah, better watch out for. No, absolutely not. He has an obligation to invoke or to indicate that he doesn't want to talk about that. Then the question becomes, can they use that against him? Or are we going to rely on a case like Robu and say, um, you know, you, you just can't be selective, so all bets are off. It's sort of a gotcha jurisprudence. He lost his rights and he didn't even know about it. Why? Because you decided to talk. And because you decided to talk, you now can't be selective. But back to this very important point that nothing in the warnings say that. You have the right to remain silent. It doesn't say you have the right to remain silent, but only if you're completely silent. Was he given the so-called fifth Miranda warning here? I'm sorry? Was he given the so-called fifth Miranda warning, that is, you may stop at any time? Um, he was. They, they say, uh, I, I believe they say, if you decide to answer any questions, you may stop at any time. And again, here's my point. They don't say, but if you say anything else or you start again, the fact that you stopped can be used against you later. They don't say that, okay? And there's a very important point here also, is that when he communicated what he communicated at the outset, uh, the police confirm that he can do what he wants to do. He hears the warnings. He believes he can say, okay, well, I'll talk to you, but I don't want to talk about things that could jeopardize me. The police say, fine, absolutely. They confirm. You can do that. Now we get on appeal in the Supreme Judicial Court and the government says, you can't be selective. Sorry, all bets are off. He started to talk and therefore- You can be selective, it's just that, that when you are selective, it's not gonna be wiped off the record, right? I mean, in other words, he doesn't have to answer the question. He can say, I'm not answering that question. You're saying, when he says, I'm not answering that question, if you were, if you're talking about what goes into evidence, you'd have to have a, I take it you've got to just have a break, and that exchange doesn't come in. Right? I think the, that, well, I think that's right, although I think the Commonwealth is taking a different position. I, I know they are, but that's your position. I, I take it that if, 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 put aside for a minute whether any of these selective, not, not the one, not the first one about, I, I think we should stop there, but uh, I don't want to answer that question kind of thing. Right. What, what you're saying should happen then, I take it, is in terms of trial, you go along, there's a 35 second uh, wipe it off the record, and then you continue. That's right. You right? Can, Delete you, it and, that's keep, right. and keep going. You can't use it against a defendant. It, can't, you know, it can be selectively invoked. But I want to make the important point again that this case really is distinguishable because Mr. Howard's not doing that. He's no, trying you, to tell them at the outset, I don't want to talk about things that right, could jeopardize but, me, but and then he you says, I want to stop. Saying, okay, put that one aside for a minute. Are you also saying that in the subsequent times when he was picking and choosing questions, that each one of those was a sort of global stop? I, I, I well, uh, not necessarily later, but again, I think those are subsumed and the fruits yeah, of you, the I, initial violation. Right, I understand but, that. But I agree with the second, third, sixth, seventh, ninth, and tenth federal circuits that a defendant can selectively invoke his right to silence. Now, if I can turn you to a different argument, uh, I gather the defense here essentially was it was second degree, not first degree. That's correct. Uh, mental impairment instruction. Yes. No mental impairment instruction given that may bear on the issue of deliberate premeditation or extreme atrocity or cruelty. That's right. Any objection given? No. Uh, did Dr. Joss speak of that in his testimony? Did, he, did anything that he say bear on the issue of whether the defendant had the capacity to yes, deliberately that premeditate? Was his, or, that was his testimony in the basis of the defense, exactly. So, so the, Joss def, the Dr. Joss defense w focused on this issue of mental impairment. Exactly, and he didn't have the capacity, especially at that time, to form that, uh, that, that form but, of malice. So, so did the judge, I know I should remember this, but did the judge basically give the 
the general instruction of being whenever a question of knowledge or intent comes up, you can you can take into account uh, the evidence the, concerning. The, the judge did not give an adequate instruction on that. I, um, I mean, I know she didn't. I know she didn't. But the judge did give an instruction with regard to both intent and knowledge. She did, but not, not specifically as to deliberate premeditation or extreme atrocity or cruelty. That's correct. But, That's correct. Okay, but in terms of um, um, where, when was this tried? I'm sorry. When was this tried? Uh, 2011, January okay. 2011. In 2011, and and for the previous, I don't know, 20 years, I, um, hasn't that been the directive? Put, put aside model homicide instructions, which. Are, are somewhat mixed, but hasn't the, the case law directed saying you got to do this once, but you don't have to repeat it? Well, um, I'm not exactly sure about that at the moment, but I would say that she, it, she really excluded a primary portion of the model um, jury instructions on homicide, which is indicated in both of my briefs. Um, she's completely left it out, and she gave a very limited, watered-down instruction um, that simply was not adequate. Uh, in my remaining couple of minutes, uh, I would like to address prosecutorial misconduct. Um, the alleged bad acts in this case, consisting of Mr. Howard supposedly threatening to attack somebody with a knife, which was actually untrue, it was defensive, racist comments against Mexicans, racist comments against Haitians, threatening multiple times to shoot somebody with a gun, supposedly, abusing his wife and kids, who, know how, who knows how long that goes back, perhaps decades, I guess. Um, none of these folks were the victim in this case, and the incidents at his workplace were six months to a year or more before this shooting. Um, this was extreme prosecutorial misconduct, and while the government wants this court to look at these in isolation and in a vacuum, the fact is the court need only look at the prosecutor's actions and conduct to recognize how this bad act evidence was used. He argued as his central theme to the jury that Mr. Howard is a mean man, that Mr. Howard is a violent man, that Mr. Howard is a bully, that he is a waste of a life, and he deserves no sympathy. And that conduct tells the court exactly how this evidence was used. Similarly, the Commonwealth tells the court that the prosecutor didn't attack or argue an adverse inference for Mr. Howard's intent to rely on his right to silence because he didn't completely remained silent, and therefore the prosecutor couldn't have used it against him. But that's divorced from what actually happened in this case, because what the prosecutor did is the prosecutor focused on his language and the interaction at the outset of the interrogation. And these were his words, quote, what did he tell the police? I'll talk to you guys, but there are certain things I'm not going to talk about because they might incriminate me. And the police say, okay, whatever, those are your rights. And he never wanted to go there. He didn't want to talk about the gun. He didn't want to talk about where it was. He didn't want to talk about the shooting because it might incriminate him. No kidding, Clyde. He's a violent man. So uh, this conduct falls far outside of what is acceptable in our courts. Uh, it is inexcusable. It was enormously prejudicial, and I would ask the court to reverse the convictions on that ground. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, may it please the court. Jamie Michael Charles, Assistant District Attorney for Middlesex on behalf of the Commonwealth. Uh, Your Honors, I'd like to start uh, where my brother did by discussing the interview uh, conducted at the Cambridge Police Department with the defendant uh, the day after the shooting. Addressing first the initial waiver of the defendant's right to remain silent. Uh, as the Commonwealth noted in its brief, the defendant is seeking to rely upon terms that are completely devoid of support in the case law of the Commonwealth. Uh, there is no case in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that recognizes a defendant's right to a conditional or partial waiver of Miranda rights. Uh, as Justice Gantz noted, one of the rights of the defendant is read notes that he can, at any point after he chooses to speak, stop. And that right basically safeguards a defendant from feeling as though it is an all or nothing proposition. The Commonwealth isn't arguing that once a defendant waives his right to remain silent, he can no longer refuse to answer questions. As Justice Botsford noted, obviously that is permissible. Uh, 
What it means is that his decision after he waives his right to refuse to answer particular questions does not constitute in and of itself a reinvocation of the global right to remain silent. Now, Mr. Shaw says that the second, third, and I'm not going to remember all, but there was about five or six sure. circuits uh, take a different view. Is that, is that your understanding? I, I haven't the read The Commonwealth cases. would dispute that. In particular, in his reply brief, the defendant cites two federal circuit cases. I believe they are U.S. v. May and Heard v. Terhune. Those cases do not concern a defendant's initial waiver of his rights. They also do not concern whether refusal to answer a specific question constitutes an invocation of the global right to remain silent. What they concern is whether the Commonwealth at trial can comment on a defendant's refusal to answer a question or omission to answer a question. So that is a due process issue. That is completely separate from the question of whether or not the defendant A, waived his right initially, or B, reinvoke that right later on. So the Commonwealth would dispute those cases' applicability here. Because we're talking- yeah, But I, I thought, what, I, thought I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I thought that if you, <coughs> that, that w while it is true that the defendant says he invoked it at the beginning and everything after that stays out, but I thought the, the secondary argument is even if that's not the case, what should happen when there is selective invocation to a particular question is that the invocation, presumably the question and the invocation, don't get presented to the jury. You skip over it. Well, this, this will sort of overlap with the prior bad acts argument, but here what happened was there was a pretrial agreement to introduce the entirety of the interview into evidence. The jury saw a video of the entire interview, and they read a transcript of the, not the entire, but there was a very small portion at the end that was redacted where the about, police got into the record. prior criminal history of the defendant. But otherwise, everything was presented to the jury. So this was evidence that was coming into the jury room with them. So with regards in particular to counsel's lamentations regarding statements in closing, specifically the commentary from the Commonwealth that the defendant said he didn't want to answer specific questions because it might incriminate him, number one, Defense counsel, in his closing argument, had specifically said, um, Mr. Howard is not saying he didn't commit this murder. He's just <laughs> saying his mental impairment prohibited him from realizing what was happening in the moment. And if you look at the interview, that's exactly what it shows. He remembers everything, just not what happened right there. And the Commonwealth is saying, well, that's ridiculous. Look at this admissible evidence that is in the record. He clearly is saying, I don't want to answer these questions because it's going to incriminate me, not because I don't remember. So while the Commonwealth is not arguing on a more global scale, I don't think we even need to get to the whether we can comment on his invocation in the context where he hasn't actually invoked his right to remain silent, because the Commonwealth maintains that he did not invoke or re-invoke that right. So the inference that you say is appropriate is he chose not to speak, and therefore he chose not to speak because what he would have said would be incriminating? What we're saying is that here, typically we prohibit commentary on this evidence because it's not before the jury. The jury never typically hears that a defendant has invoked his right. That's not something that typically comes in evidence. Here it was in evidence by agreement. The jury had it before them. It was on paper. It was in the video. It was going in the jury room with right. them. The jury heard the invocation, but they did not hear the inference that the reason he chose not to speak is because what he would have said would have been incriminating? Well, the defendant at page 6364 of the interview says, and this is what the Commonwealth was talking about, that part I want to leave out. There's certain details I would like to leave out because it could be construed as though maybe I'm the culprit. Right. Well, he did admit, I mean, he did shoot him. There's no doubt that he shot somebody. I mean, hours so that, before. So the Commonwealth is saying, he is saying, look at this interview that, is, that you have read and that you have seen. He is saying, I don't want to talk about these specific details because you might think I'm the guy. All right. And, and, He's and, not saying, and that is directly rebutting what was said in defense closing, which is, well, look at the evidence. He doesn't remember what happened. And, and, and how does the prosecutor, how does a prosecutor in good faith refer to a defendant as a bully, a violent man, a mean man, a waste of a life. Proper? Not in the context of this case. If you look at the interview, and again. It's not proper or it is proper? Oh, I'm context. sorry, I said, is that a problem? I misheard you, my no, apologies. is it proper? Hands. Here it's absolutely proper. If you look at this case, if you look at the interview that was introduced, the entire uh, 
structure of the defendant's defense was Clyde Howard is a victim. Clyde Howard was subjected to intimidation, to bullying, not just by the victim, but by Miguel Carballido, by Shane Nixon. These guys were a schoolyard gang of bullies, and they intimidated my client and harassed him. And whether or not their intimidation amounted to the type of conduct that would warrant this sort of shooting, it, based on his mental impairment, he interpreted it that way, and that caused him to act. The Commonwealth had to be able to rebut this. There was plenty of eyewitness testimony put on a trial. There was plenty of evidence just in the interview alone that the Commonwealth had to be able to suggest, no, Clyde Howard is not a victim. He is not this model employee who is meek and who tries to avoid conflict and who is uh, always the one who is suffering at the hands of others. He's the guy that's inflicting that harm on others. He is constantly antagonizing people at work. He takes forklifts just to be difficult. He makes comments about the victim's girlfriend's ethnicity just to get under his skin. When he gets upset, he rams his car into other people's cars. We were directly rebutting the main premise on which the defense was suggesting that this was a secondary case. But, but how do you, how do you um, I, I, at least I understood uh, Mr. S Mr. Um, uh, Shaw to be arguing that the prior bad act testimony got swept up into this uh, into this argument and, and effectively was used for an improper purpose. You can't use prior bad act, prior bad act evidence to show um, uh, propensity. And that's exactly what, what it was used for in the closing argument. It really was not. I think, first of all, my brother seeks to just pull these isolated comments out without, your, your honors have to look at the closing argument as a whole. The closing argument starts out with the Commonwealth saying, you know, defense counsel says that there's only one Clyde Howard, but that's not true. There are two types of, there are two Clyde Howards, essentially. He's not a victim. He is this guy who, as I've just been indicating to you, he's this guy who bullies other people, who goes out of his way to antagonize other people, he was never, in fact, intimidated by the victim. The well, victim. What's the business about a life that's wasted? How's that fit in? Well, for, the Commonwealth would for two points. The Commonwealth would first submit that it's not entirely clear from that statement that the Commonwealth isn't saying that the victim's life was wasted. Secondly, the Commonwealth would just a waste of a life. Say, oh, a I'm waste of a life. Oh, it's an offhand. It, so it's not entirely clear that that is not being subsumed into the argument, just saying, "Oh, what a waste of a life that the victim's dead." Secondly, even if that's not the interpretation you want to give to that statement, uh, he's just, it's that isolated comment in the context of everything else that was said, which the Commonwealth submits was appropriate to rebut the direct defense of the defendant, that he is this victim. That isolated comment uh, in the context of an uh, unobjected to closing argument is not the sort of comment that we reverse a conviction for. But I would just like to, just to refocus on, on what the Commonwealth presented in terms of prior bad acts. I think Commonwealth v. Uh, Maimoni, and I apologize if I'm butchering that statement, 41 Mass App Court 321 is the most salient case in that regard. Um, and in that case, what happened was the defendant essentially was alleged to have murdered uh, the wife of another man who he took on his boat with him on a sailing trip and, and allegedly bludgeoned her on that boat and dumped her body in the ocean. Uh, the defendant said to police at the outset of their uh, interview that, well, I would never take a woman who was married on, on a boat. That's inappropriate. I would never do something like that. Uh, the court said, well, as an elementary matter, first and foremost, we're going to allow you to put in this evidence of prior bad acts, which was instances in the past where the defendant had taken two other people, not this victim, onto his boat and made sexual advances at them taken off his clothes in their entirety and stood naked in front of them and harassed them. And the court said, well, of course we're going to let that in because the Commonwealth is entitled to rebut this presentation that the defendant made of himself as someone who would never do something like that. And then separate and apart from that, in that case, the defendant also put on an expert to suggest that he lacked the mental capacity to form malice for first degree murder. And the court said, again, where the defendant presents expert testimony that his client uh, could not have formed the requisite intent due to diminished capacity, the Commonwealth has to be able to rebut that. 
And that's exactly what happened in this case. So, so, so essentially, the, you, I take it you're saying that the defendant uh, made an issue of, of his good character. Uh, that was the foundation. That was his whole case. Because it's not just, I have a mental impairment. If you read the testimony of Dr. Joss from start to finish, what he is saying is, this defendant has a perception problem. He has this access to personality disorder with schizoid paranoid qualities. So what he's saying is, it's all premised on the intimidation. He was suffering at the hands of this victim. He was being prodded, he was being intimidated, and his personality disorder exacerbated that to the point that in his eyes, this victim was such a threat that he had to respond with this deadly force. So if you don't believe this statement that the defendant was a victim and that he was being harassed, and if in fact he was the person antagonizing and the victim was uh, the actual victim of harassment dating back X number of months, then the whole defense falls apart. Because if, he was nev if, if Clyde Howard was never a victim of harassment and intimidation, then there's no way he could have interpreted uh, that Mr. Ricketts was a threat. And there's no way you could find that this personality disorder affected him to the degree that he had a diminished capacity and couldn't form the necessary malice or deliberate premeditation necessary for this murder. So this was the defendant's case. And that, I would submit, is why the defendant wanted to put in the whole interview. If you look at uh, the transcript from January 18th, which is the pretrial hearing transcript, the defendant goes on for pages talking about all of these different points in the interview and why they're relevant. He says it's relevant to the defendant's state of mind. The victim tormented the defendant. Uh, the defendant was afraid of the victim. Uh, he is making a case for this entire interview needing to come in to show that this defendant, because Clyde Howard's not going to take the stand. He's not doing that at trial, as is his right. So all he has to put on this victim story is this interview. And he says, and I quote, it's a strategic decision, well calculated, and I accept the potential consequences on 118. He says that in the transcript. He needs to have Clyde Howard be presented to the jury in some way as a victim to support this mental health defense. And the Commonwealth's case was entirely focused on rebutting this uh, theory, which by or my the, view. The theory that he was not indeed afraid of the victim? Because yes. Because the prior bad acts went well beyond that. The what prior bad acts well, they spoke didn't, about. I would submit that they did not, and here's why. Well, it's if because you, you're saying that the other people. Are, yes, he, yeah. and I can cite you. If you look at the defendant's interview, uh, he presents the victim as collaborating, essentially, with Carballito and with Nixon. It's not just the victim that's harassing him. I th I'm going to quote for you. Um, so he starts at page 18 of the interview. He said, so this Mexican guy, Carballito, must have been talking to him. And that's in the context of saying, you know, he wasn't harassing me right away, but then he did start harassing me. And so this other guy must have been talking to him. I said to some, I, and this is at page 19, I said to myself, how can somebody influence a grown man to have this animosity? So the, the Mexican, Carballito, is influencing Ricketts. Then he says, Ricketts was always starting with this guy named Shane. That's in the context of talking about uh, why uh, the victim was making additional harassing comments to him. So now we've associated uh, the victim with Shane Nixon. Then he goes and says at page 25, 26, uh, the victim and Carballito were always, quote unquote, playing games together. And then at page 27, the victim and the Mexican were talking. And these are all comments he makes in the context of talking about how he is abused and harassed and how this victim is going out of his way to make Clyde Howard's life difficult at work. So he is now, and as I noted at the outset, so he has now essentially grouped these individuals together. These people are making my life at work miserable. They're intimidating me all the time. I can't, I'm just trying to avoid them. I never seek out conflict. I should have talked to the police, but I just thought it would resolve itself. And none of that is supported by any of the testimony of eyewitnesses at trial. And that's what the Commonwealth was trying to show. While the defendant is saying that these guys are giving him a hard time, and that's what led to this, that he just blew a stack, that he just had enough, None of this had ever happened. Not one iota of it was true. Shane Nixon says, I never saw the victim do anything. Mark Dunn says, I never saw the victim do anything. If anything, the victim tried to avoid Clyde Howard. So you have all of these acts that are coming in to show that the defendant is the one in the workplace making these statements, antagonizing the victim, not vice versa. And so if, they can, if the Commonwealth can prove that everything the defendant said is is ridiculously unsupported by any factual evidence other than his own self-serving statements, uh, 
There's no basis for this defense, and it becomes clear that this was uh, a defendant who had something against the victim from way back. And this was just a classic case of deliberately premeditated murder. There was no mental health aspect. There was no, I just blew my stack. There was, this was the culmination of Clyde Howard's longstanding harassment of the victim at work, not Clyde Howard reacting to the victim's harassment of him. Okay. And so that is what the Commonwealth was trying to do at trial. If I can turn you to the, the, the jury instruction. Yes. Uh, entire case focused on mental impairment. Uh, model, model instructions in 1999 provide that the jury should be instructed that mental impairment may be considered with regard to deliberate premeditation and extreme atrocity or cruelty. Instruction not given here. How is that not reversible? So I think there are a couple points that need to be made. First and foremost, in framing the analysis, this was a jury instruction that was not objected to. Right. So I know we are considering whether it creates a substantial likelihood. Was it requested? That was my next point. And I apologize for not including this in my supplemental appendix. But if you look at the defendant's request for jury instructions, the requested jury instruction that the defendant asked for on mental impairment is keyed to intent as it relates to malice. That is the instruction the defendant asked for. There is, the defendant's requested instruction was not the model instruction. He, he did not submit an instruction that mirrored the model instruction. He had his own formulation of how he wanted it. And if you look at that instruction, I would submit to you that it is primarily focused on intent and knowledge as it relates to malice. And that instruction was given here. Uh, the Commonwealth admits that per Gould, there probably should have been some sort of mention with regards to extreme atrocity and cruelty that there was uh, mental impairment here. However, I think in this case it's muted somewhat because uh, unlike the issue uh, Justice Gantz raised in Barry, uh, here we have evidence under the first Canine factor. Uh, that essentially, as was acknowledged, uh, that the defendant was indifferent to or took pleasure in suffering. That is the only Canine factor that implicates intent. So we had a general instruction that when considering intent, you can consider uh, the defendant's mental state. And here, there was certainly a lot of evidence presented at trial that this was a defendant who took pleasure in this killing. He chased the victim down through a chemical warehouse. He cornered him out back behind a dumpster. He fired two shots close range into the victim. And then after turning to walk away, he thinks about it, turns back, comes, holds the gun within a foot of the victim's head, and fires another shot. And he says, gotcha, after he shot him. So this is a defendant who is relishing this act, that he is clearly taking pleasure in the fact that he just murdered this innocent victim. It, is, uh, it seems a little odd, though, that um, a mental impairment instruction was not given, given the fact that this case was tried the way it was tried. Well, was it ever discussed at a charge there, conference? There was a mental impairment instruction. Oh. Let's, let's be clear. And not just once, but twice. Uh, twice the jury were instructed, and I apologize for not... It was generally about knowledge and intent, yeah? Yes, the jury were instructed that any time you consider the defendant's knowledge and intent in the context of whether he could form the requisite degree of malice for first degree or second degree murder, you must consider. You may consider any evidence of his uh, mental health. But but but, I mean, you, it's classically given in the context of premeditation or extreme atrocity or cruelty. Did they talk about why it shouldn't be given on, on those issues? So the comma. The Commonwealth's review of the transcript does not reveal any discussion on the record about what degree of mental impairment instruction should be given. Uh, the defendant requested his instruction. The Commonwealth had its suggestion. And uh, what did the, what did I see the Commonwealth request? I'm sorry? What did the Commonwealth request? Uh, I, the the I Shelley the, the, um, and... Uh, I apologize, I do not have the Commonwealth's exact okay. request in front of me. That was in the record of trial, but not reflected in the transcript. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions, the Commonwealth would ask that you affirm these convictions. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to have to rely on the court to look at the record because there's much there that I'd like to address. I won't have time to address, but let me say... Um, the Commonwealth says that um, because this evidence was in that Mr. Howard um, didn't want to incriminate himself, it permits the government to then comment on it. Uh, we're not just talking about a comment here. We're talking about a prosecutor 
who wants to penalize and prejudice the defendant for having wanted to rely on his right to silence. That's the difference. Uh, that is clearly incorrect. It's improper. I hope the court will look at the video, I assume the court will, of Mr. Howard. Because what the court is going to find is that Mr. Howard is not a mean man. And that's clear. It's just not his nature. And that's precisely why the government focused on these bad acts the way the government did. They felt they uh, needed to do so. Um, I think it's important to note also that in this case, Mr. Howard's defense was not that everybody's ganging up on me. This case was only about Mr. Howard and the victim. And yes, Mr. Howard said that this individual who was much bigger than him, who was much younger than him, was intimidating him, was harassing him, told him, pull your knife, I'll knock you out. Yes, Mr. Howard, in an environment like this, at a workplace, didn't get along very well with Mr. Carbolito, but that wasn't his focus during this statement, uh, okay? And um, defense counsel did want this statement to come in at trial, but the reason he wanted it to come in is because the Commonwealth wanted to cherry pick it in a way that he felt was going to be prejudicial to Mr. Howard. And if you look at volume one, I believe it's at about page 108, but I'm not exactly sure, you're going to see that counsel explains why he wanted it in. Um, and he says, I, it's a strategic decision. I'm going to let the whole thing in because I, I think it's necessary. But the fact is, is that he was doing that because he didn't want – his reasoning was that, that uh, certain aspects of this normally wouldn't be able to come in, but I'm going to let them in anyway because I feel that it's important that the jury hear the whole statement. Your time is up. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll take our morning recess. Thank you. All right.